Afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much for coming to the closing uh, panel. We're I, definitely going to have a very good time uh, over the next hour. My name is Craig Allen, and I'm the president of the US-China Business Council. Um, that is a group of about uh, 220 multinational American companies, all of whom are heavily invested uh, in China. Uh, we have uh, been around for 50 years, and all of our members every day are struggling with the problems of uh, making globalization work. And that is the title of this panel. And we have assembled a wonderful, interesting group of commentators uh, to talk about different elements of uh, globalization. Um, so the three questions that we were asked to talk about was um, how do we achieve the best mix of globalization? And how do we measure success of globalization? And then thirdly, uh, is the West deglobalizing as China globalizes? So I think that uh, those are three uh, very big questions, very interesting questions. And we're going to approach that uh, from a number of very uh, useful perspectives that I'm sure will benefit uh, everyone uh, in this room. So what I would like to do uh, is introduce all of our panelists and let them tell you a little bit about themselves uh, and their thoughts about the three questions or one of the three questions. Uh, and then uh, we will, uh, I, I will ask, uh, when we finish that, uh, I'll ask each of them a follow-up question. Um, uh, and then if we have time, uh, we will open it up uh, for uh, each of you. So um, please allow me to take one minute uh, to introduce our, our panelists and then invite our first speaker. Um, so at my left is Michelle uh, uh, Wooker, and I shall ask her to lead off. Michelle is the founder of Gray Rhino and Company, and she is the author of a book um, uh, by the same name, uh, Gray Rhino, which um, is well known that Xi Jinping uh, has read and is on his bookshelf and is referred to. So she is a big celebrity. Uh, in China, and all of you are very lucky uh, to be here uh, to meet her. Um, and secondly, um, uh, following Michelle, who will lead off, um, I'd like to ask uh, Peng and Angelica to look at these, uh, the issue of globalization from an investor's point of view. So Peng is uh, Secretary General of Tsinghua Asset Management Group. And I think everyone here knows uh, Tsinghua is a, a very uh, special name in Chinese tech. And uh, I very much look forward to her perspective on globalization. Uh, Angelica is founding a partner of Silk Ventures. So she is from Eastern Europe, but currently in UK. So uh, offering, I think, a different perspective and a unique perspective that I'm looking forward to uh, very much. Uh, following our two investors, uh, we have two technologists who will approach the issue of globalization just a little bit differently. Uh, first, Max Wang. Uh, Max is the vice chairman of the China Triumph International Engineering Company and uh, has lots of experience with Zhou uh, Chu uh, Chu or leaving China, investing elsewhere, China's interface with globalization in the technology area. So uh, certainly he has a, a lot to offer here. And then finally, uh, Ben Gertzel, who is uh, uh, the founder of Singularity Net, which is a Hong Kong, also Shenzhen, also Holland, uh, also just a global AI company doing some very interesting work uh, uh, making AI a global phenomenon, supporting uh, China's efforts uh, 
to, in AI to integrate uh, a global AI system. And so I think it very fitting uh, that we hear uh, from uh, Ben uh, last. And uh, so with that, um, maybe I can ask Michelle to kick us off. Would that be okay? That would be more than okay. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for such a warm introduction and, and thanks to Harassas for, it's just been an amazing uh, couple of days with conversations here. Uh, for those of you who don't know what a gray rhino is, it's the big two-ton thing that's very dangerous. It's the horn, it's kind of pointing right at you, it's charging at you, and uh, it gives you a choice. You've got to do something or not. So it's not like the elephant in the room, which normalizes that nobody talks about the big thing. This is the big thing that everyone's talking about. They're still not doing anything about. And uh, I, I coined it sort of as a response to the black swan uh, which became big during the financial crisis, this idea that uh, you're going to get bowled over by something that's so big, but so unforeseeable, unimaginable, you're never going to see it coming. And uh, I, I think it was a very good message that you need to be aware that something's going to come and whoop you upside the head, as we said in Texas, where, where I grew up. Um, but people really used it as a cop-out. There were things that people did see coming and too many people just said, oh, nobody could have seen it coming, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bother with it. Um, I lived in Manhattan at the time uh, of the global financial crisis and uh, I bought an, an apartment in 2001, which almost doubled in value in four years, which was a pretty good sign to me that something was not normal. And um, having in a previous life been a financial journalist uh, follows a lot of uh, monetary cycles. Can, can you guys all hear this? Yeah, the work. Ooh, sorry. Um, but having followed monetary cycles, I, I could see that something was, was going to happen, and so I sold the apartment. So clearly there was something that a lot of people saw, and you've read stories in hindsight of, of you know, the big short of people who saw something coming. So I said, what if we took all this energy that went into the black swan, which by definition you can't see, so you can't really do much about, and focused it on the highly obvious, highly probable things that we can see and we're not doing anything about. So that's sort of where the gray rhino came from. And I think it's a very important context when it comes to globalization and some of the unintended consequences of globalization. Uh, again, uh, looking at animals, um, Franco Milanovic has this wonderful book called The, the Elephant Chart. Uh, which is basically a way of showing that as a result of globalization, the very, very rich and the very, very poor did a lot better. But the middle class, particularly in developed countries, not so much. And, and that set a context for some of the conflicts and the debates that we're seeing today over globalization, that the, the middle classes and, and also the lower classes in, in the West, who although they were poorer than the richer people, you know, we're definitely better off than the poorest people in the world, the bottom billion who were, were doing better off. They felt a lot of resentment over the fact that globalization was really leaving them behind. Uh, and that's where you see these populist movements in, uh, in the United States and in Europe coming from. Uh, at the same time, there's been this big gap uh, between the, the, the West and Asia in their attitudes towards some of the other forces happening, a technological change, fourth industrial revolution. And going back and forth between Asia and the United States, I always get the sense of, of whiplash at how conscious people are in Asia, in China in particular, about technological change, you know, about the opportunities as well as the challenges. And when you come to the United States, all the blame for the pain that the middle and lower classes are feeling seems to really fall on, on China, on immigrants, on globalization, uh, but there's not really enough talk about technology, about the fourth industrial revolution, about the impact of those changes on the labor market. And so the, the United States uh, government really hasn't paid enough attention to those issues, so you've seen a the United States falling behind in skills. You've also seen the United States falling behind in infrastructure investment and all of the things that, that Asia is really, really racing ahead on. There have also been some global polls about globalization and probably not surprisingly, uh, the countries that have benefited the most, particularly emerging markets, I mean, you know, Vietnam comes to mind, 
are the most supportive of globalization, thinks that it has, it has benefited them. And the legacy countries, the developed countries, who of course were gonna be growing more slowly because it was from a higher base in the first place, uh, were the ones who were least likely to support globalization. So those are the, the big obvious global trends that are behind what we're seeing now, which is the United States and the West pulling back from globalization and uh, Asia in particular, seeing the advantages, but also being much more sensitive to the potential risks and moving ahead with globalization. Uh, there's another dynamic behind this, which is what I call a, a meta gray rhino, which is sort of a, a big structural top level situation, which is that attitudes towards risk and change are very, very different in the West and in Asia. Uh, there's a study I love to quote, it was, I believe it was in 2017, of 300 something odd artificial intelligence experts around the world. And they ask them, when are we going to get high level machine intelligence, which is when machines will be able to do just about everything better than humans. And it was interesting that uh, the Americans thought it would take more than twice as long as the Asians in the survey did. So there's much more of a sense of urgency in Asia about technology, about the fourth industrial revolution, the, the future of work in this context, which are the things that I, I get asked to talk about a lot in Asia. But in the United States, there's this sense of, you know, we're losing our global supremacy, we're falling behind. There's a sense of resentment towards the rest of the world. And so this question of, you know, is, is China globalizing and the US and the West not? Well, I think it's very, very obvious. Those are some of the reasons sure. behind it. Um, and, and I'll let the last, rest of the group weigh in on it sure. before we get to the question of, of solutions. What do we do about it? How do we, how do we wrangle this, this gray rhino and move forward? Thank you for framing that so beautifully. Well done, well, yeah. Um, Fung, please. Okay. Um, and thank you, Greg. I'm very happy to be here especially in my last 25 years, I'm always doing globalization and localization with Microsoft, with uh, Cambridge University, uh, with a venture fund based in London, and now uh, with, uh, with Tsinghua. Um, I would like to, uh, I know globalization is very complicated, it's all about the politics, about economic, uh, it's about the uh, technology, about culture, things. So I'd like to use a network perspective uh, to see it, to, to address it. It's about the dynamics of the network, the reconfiguration of that, and how make the network work well, especially, uh, mm. I, it reminds me, 15, about 15 years ago, emerging markets uh, story come out, that lots of uh, the government, and uh, also multinationals response, uh, how, to, uh, how to respond to the, uh, uh, the emerging market stories. But now think about China became the, the, the second largest economy in the world. So people now think about how, how China uh, in the global, uh, we say the, the globalization networks. So one thing I would like to, uh, in a practical or th uh, way, we was, I would say about thinking, think globally and doing locally. So for example, from investor perspective, um, we have down investments in, in US and also in, in, in Europe. So that's why we are thinking how we take advantage of the uh, stress of e e each regions. So, but we definitely do using local team. For example, for our funds uh, in Europe, we, we have pure local team. So that's really make, make it works. Uh, I think last I will give you introduce about my organization because Greg mentioned about Tsinghua. Actually, uh, Tsinghua Assets Management uh, Group is the uh, Tsinghua Holdings financial service platform. Uh, Tsinghua Holdings is wholly owned by the Tsinghua University. Uh, we, we have the, all the technology uh, sectors. We have healthcare, we have TMT, uh, we also have new energies. So it's almost very much re reflects the uh, research and education of the university. So at the other side, uh, in my organization, we have the very early stage, the seeds funds, and also we have venture funds, PE, 
merger and acquisition. So it's a, we, we cover all the life cycle of, uh, of our startups. At the other side of our business, we have the traditional financial services. We have life insurance, we have leasing, leasing things. So it, it's a kind of a we, but we just focus on technology, technology things. Thank That's you. fantastic. Angelica, how about your, your, your views from a European perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, good evening, everyone, first of all. And I'll quickly take the opportunity to thank Frank and the organizers for this wonderful event. It's, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm just mesmerized by the uh, diversity of ideas and opinions I'm hearing here. And I heard today, um, I, um, I, I, I've been going to a few conferences in China over the past few months, and uh, there's uh, usually a very homogenous view in China. There's, you you get the, the vision from, uh, from the top, usually in Beijing, and then everyone kind of uh, has a homogenous opinion. Uh, well, here we, we had so many different opinions today. I'm, I'm just mesmerized. Uh, I had to take uh, write down some ideas to make sure I'm staying consistent <laughs> with, with mine. So um, a summary of, of my view from uh, kind of the middle ground in Europe, um, because globalization now is, is, is pretty much led by US and China, uh, even if in two different directions. Um, so the summary in one sentence would be that um, conflict is as inevitable as cooperation is um, imperative. Um, both China and the US are undergoing a, a historical um, adjustment of their relationship um, towards each other. And um, there's, uh, there's a lot of criticizing going on. Um, and to, to quote one of, my, uh, one of my friends and one of my favorite voices in uh, China international relations, criticize, not uh, demonize. That's, that's what we should do. Um, in China, I'm hearing a uh, homogenous view that uh, the trade war is hurting the US even more than it is uh, China, than it, it is hurting China. Um, and there are figures to support this, for example, um, the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the tariffs end up being paid, half of them be end up being paid by actually American companies. Um, and uh, from, from the US perspective, I might be wrong, but this is just my, uh, my observation here, um, there is, uh, this, the situation seems to be a lot more pessimistic than, than in China. Um, the ideological clash, the difference in values, uh, which are very much at the core of this, uh, of this trade war, uh, don't seem to be making progress towards the direction that uh, the US desires. Um, so uh, I believe the, the, next, uh, the next era of, of uh, relations and, and, uh, between the US and China and, and how globalization is going to be managed will depend very much on establishing some sort of respect towards each other's differences. Um, and um, also perhaps the EU could lend some lessons. We do have a, a history of over 60 years of uh, managing very different values and uh, negotiating and implementing um, trade policies, um, uh, competition policies, um, monetary policies. So maybe the EU, the EU could be taking a, a role in this, which it isn't doing yet. So I'll stop here before we that's move right. on. Uh, like in GDPR, perhaps, uh, that, that's a standard that might be useful for both countries. That's well, I have a feeling that California can be more creative with the GDPR and uh, come up with something even better. <laughs> there we go. Um, let's turn it over to Max. Max Xiao Chang, Zhongwen, yeah, Huaning, Qing. Yeah. Uh, first, I'm very happy to join this meeting. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to share my mind. Uh, with everybody here, yeah. Uh, first, I come from the daughter company for the uh, CNBM. CNBM is the uh, Chinese state uh, biggest company uh, and also the biggest in the world for building material, yeah. Uh, certainly, um, I am the daughter company. We do the EPC for building material. During these uh, 30 years, we had do a lot of uh, work for every country, more than 50 different country for EPC, for glass, for cement, for solar power, also include America. And also, um, I working for this company also more than 30 years, yeah. Uh, so we do, uh, we make 
um, globalization um, work for these things. Uh, for example, American company like Guardian, like Libby, uh, and also another company, they are famous in America and in the world. When they built the factory overseas, we can service for them. But, and, and also, we buy a lot of manufacturers from the different country. In China, they built, for example, Libby, is famous tableware company in America and famous in the world. But uh, only one company, one factory they built overseas is first in China. I built for them. Because we can understand them because we are the complete company from A to Z. We do the R&D, we do the manufacture, and we do the EPC build. So we can understand them very, very deep, very deep. So we can use the different country manufacture technology to build in China, in America, and the third country. During these 30 years, is a big uh, work for us, yeah. Uh, certainly, I think um, in this uh, section, a special section, yeah, a lot of program in the world, yeah. Um, we think three points I want to say. First, we need to uh, plan. Second, we need to um, believe ourselves, American and China. The third, we think uh, we need to uh, think for ourselves. Yeah. The first, actually, in China, we had good uh, succeed during this uh, 40 or 70 years after 1949. We had a good development. Certainly, we're learning a lot of things from America. We believe it is very good support for us. We're learning from America for the government control and also uh, the lawyer system, we, we also get some uh, mind. And also we're learning the technology from America and the innovation from America. Certainly, uh, we use basic Chinese local, uh, basic, is difference, America. We basic these things, we development ourselves. And also, plant, I think uh, American also plant. They, they are good and uh, they lead a lot of things. But in the beginning, also they learning from British or the lawyer. They, they built this country, basic the British uh, system. So, two country, we think uh, we need prom. And also we think we need to believe ourselves for the making globalization work. We need to believe we have power to do it. We think all the people need it. The, the global people, we think the new section, a lot of things cannot do it best itself. Our company have a laboratory, the IND Center in America. We also have IND Center in Germany. And also these three sites, China, America, and Germany, IND Center, they have cooperation together for our some special innovation technology. For example, for solar power, ping pong, yeah? For CDT, first solar, they have the team. For the CIGS team firm, uh, Japanese also have another team. But we, cooperation from three different countries, we believe we have the strong power to push, to make globalization work. So um, it is, uh, it is uh, the good uh, future. We think we can do it. We can do it, yeah. The third, I think we need to reduce. We need to think what is the bad things. In the new section, a lot of uh, uh, mind, they only want to protect themselves. Uh, themselves. 
I think is it a bad things. Yeah. In China, the Qing Dynasty, we are rich company. But in that time, we want to protect ourselves. We close our door. But in this th 300 or 40, 100, uh, 400 years, we lost time. We lost a chance. We don't think it's good. So we have to re review, have to rethink. We open the door. We revolution ourselves. We're learning. Yeah. So we have a good development during this 40 years. For innovation also like that. I believe uh, if American um, government think clear, they need to think they're prompt, but they need to review. They will continue to lead the innovation or not. Not only for technology, for the system, for government also need. The last uh, long history, every country, they have different way to control the country. The learning for the innovation, every section. American get to succeed. Basic, the original innovation. But in order to continue to go, they need to think, not only teach, not only teach, they need also revolution and innovation, I think. So oh. thank you very much. We've, we've had a very optimistic and, and constructive and forward-looking view from Peng and Max uh, from the Chinese side, uh, very well upheld. Uh, um, uh, ben, we'd be grateful for your thoughts uh, great, from an great. AI perspective, from a yeah, scientist so I, perspective. I've been doing AI for, I guess, more than 30 years now, and it's been an international thing from, from, from the beginning. I mean, I was educated here in the U.S. I was in academia in U.S., Australia, and New Zealand. In D.C. for nine years, applying AI to for various government agencies here. Then I've been in Hong Kong since 2011, and a bunch of I work uh, with companies in China, uh, some companies in Korea, and some companies in Western, 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 dominated by U.S. military for the first few decades since the field of AI was named in, in 1959. I, I mean, AI has been, it's been extremely global for the last couple of decades at least. I mean, e e e even before it, it became so, so prominent. And I don't, I don't see that stopping, right? So what, what, I, what I'm doing now, I'm leading an open source AI project called Singularity Net and another open source AI project called OpenCog. Each of these has contributors from, from all, over the, all over the planet. I mean, OpenCog has had contributors from every continent plus New Zealand and a, bu a bunch of other islands, right? And Singularity Net, we have a blockchain based AI marketplace supplying AI to many corporate customers in, in US, China, and all over, all over the world. And taking AI contributions from AI developers all over the world. And we also have offices in, in Hong Kong, in, in Shenzhen, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in, in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, in, in, in Bangalore, and a few scattered developers here in US and Western Europe. So I think, from my view, AI has been globalized for a long time. I don't, I don't see that stopping. But in terms of the, the question posed, sort of, is U.S. deglobalizing while, while China is, is globalizing. When I think about globalization in the AI space, which is what I know best, it's just a, it's a lot more nuanced than that question would, would suggest. And I really think of it in terms of the network of individuals and the network of software and, and hardware entities and how all these networks are interacting with each other, sh sharing in information. And wh what you see there is a quite complex perspective. What I'd say is the network of people and software and hardware entities 
they want to interconnect, right? Just like, uh, like the, the, the old saying, information wants to be free, right? I mean, the, the network wants to connect, and that's going to keep happening. And if something like tariffs blocks certain routes for connectivity, it's very easy for other routes for connectivity to, to, to spring up. And let, let me give a few examples to say, say what I mean here. So first of all, in AI, research is very global. And that isn't changing yet in any way I can see. Like AI research papers, they are posted online in archive.org, which is a US website. It began as lanl.gov from Los Alamos National Labs. And whether you're in China, Russia, Korea, or wherever, top research papers are posted in English on archive.org. Open source code goes in GitHub. I mean, there's other things like GitLab and so forth. But again, these things. These things are global in their usage, and folks from Tsinghua, Be Beida, and Fudan University, they post papers in archive and post code in GitHub also. These happen to be American initiatives, right? But they're, but they're global, very global in, in utilization. Now, the scalable rollout of the AI code put in GitHub and described the papers in archive, like the scalable rollout of this AI that uses proprietary data, and that's totally separate and, and, and uses processors that are sitting in some country. That's quite distinct in the US from in the West right now. And increasingly, it's distinct in India or Europe from the US. But the AI algorithms and ideas and the core algorithmic code, I mean, this is, is shared internationally on resources that happen to be hosted in the US right now. In, in blockchain, which is another key technology we're using in, in SingularityNet with our you know, blockchain-based decentralized marketplace. I mean, blockchain is, I mean, it's been innovated all over the world, in US, China, Europe, Australia, everywhere. I would say it's being driven ahead more by Europe than anywhere else in a way for regulatory reasons, because the SEC in the US has been, has squashed blockchain innovation in, in many ways. And of course, China has been off and on in complicated ways with, 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 with blockchain. I mean, ba banning cryptocurrencies, but now quite, quite recently making some very positive statements and, and, and moves in, in, in that direction. But the result of the regulatory scene in US and China has really been Europe. I mean, Switzerland, Malta, UK has, have really, really grabbed leadership in, in that space. So it's, it's it's not been a US versus China thing, it's, it's been a Europe thing, right? And now, one of our offices for Singularity Net, where we've done a bunch of AI and robotics development over the years, has been in Ethiopia, in, in Addis Ababa. We did a bunch of the AI software behind our Sophia robot there, and a whole lot of other things. What you see there, I mean, Chinese government and Chinese companies are being amazing in infrastructure development in, in Africa, and generally, the African people are just in love with what China and Korea as well are, are, are doing. You know, they're, they're building dams, they're, 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 bu they're building roads, they're supplying routers, and they're up upgrading the power infrastructure. That's, a, that's fantastic. Now, on the other hand, what the West is doing is also, also a lot. So look at I ICLR, which is an international conference on learning representations, one of the leading AI conferences. You know, because the US government is making it harder and harder for foreign researchers to come to conferences in the US and get a visa. ICLR, which is, is run by Joshua Bengio from in, in Montreal, so no, North American, though not US, that's being held in Addis Ababa, you know, in 2020 for, for the first time. So then this is North American-led sort of globalization of AI research. Now, Cardano, which is a major blockchain project founded by Westerners, formerly located in, in Hong Kong, you know, that they're, they're now f f giving grants to 100 Ethiopian female programmers to learn blockchain technology. So we, in the research side and the education side, I see a lot being done by Western companies and, and organizations, more so than governments in, in Africa. But on the infrastructure side, China's doing it. So there you see you know, both sides are, are globalizing in, in, in different ways, and it's, it's, all, it's all quite interesting. So if, if I look at sort of the network of AI developers and the network of information as it's, as it's passing around in the world, I think 
globalization is continuing on all fronts quite, quite interestingly. And you know, what we're doing with our Singularity Net AI platform, you know, this is a marketplace. Anyone in the world can put an AI algorithm online and then anyone in the world can access it through, through its APIs. And the AIs can also talk to each other. The idea here is you know, someone in China can put an AI online, someone in the US can put an AI online, someone in Africa can. These AIs can all talk to each other and collaborate and, and cooperate with, with each other. And you're getting a sort of global AI mind composed of, of, of AIs written by different people in different places. Now, it may be a user in China pays for AI services with RMB. A user in the US could pay with a, a cryptographic token or with the US dollar or, or, or whatever. But the, the AI mind doesn't actually care what currency that, that, that you're paying with, right? So I, I think I, I'm, I'm also fairly positive. And I, I think that we tend to pay a lot of attention to tariffs and government regulations because I mean because we, we, we have to these are the laws we have to obey but actually the most important dynamics going on, on the planet may be other than that like the most the more, most important dynamics are are different sorts of flows of you know human and, and digital information which are globalizing ongoingly to an incredible degree that's magnificent thank you for leading us uh, through a tour of the global AI world very grateful uh, let me just ask uh, everyone a quick question, and you can answer as long or as, as uh, short as you would uh, want. But Michelle, uh, your book is on Xi Jinping's uh, desk, or at least his shelf. What are the gray rhinos that um, perhaps he would face, or that China faces? Well, it's, it's fascinating to me what, what China has done with the, with the gray rhino concept, because it's, it, the gray rhino depends on your perspective. So if someone asks me, you know, what are these great rhinos? I'm like, well, I don't know what are, you know, what are yours? And it's so great the way that, that China has done that. Um, the, the biggest discussion from the government has been on financial risk, gray rhinos, you sort of you know, shadow banking and potential for, for capital market shocks, um, you know, un, uh, unregulated new financial products, you know, real estate bubbles, uh, things like that. Um, but um, when I go to China, I often get invited to talk about gray rhinos, especially the top global gray rhinos that are facing the world. Once a year, I do a sort of like a meta study. I look at all the top risks lists. So they, they ask, you know, what are the global gray rhinos and, and how do those affect uh, China? Um, when, uh, when the United States passed the, the tax reform a couple years ago, uh, the, some of the top officials in Beijing told the Wall Street Journal that that was a gray rhino for China. The, you know this this um, oh, yeah. poorly conceived you know, U.S. policy, um, and then more recently this, this sort of whole trade war situation. But I've I've also heard people apply it to you know to, to digital disruption, uh, to urban safety issues, and uh, I, I really try to encourage people to say you know what what's my gray rhino? What's what's affecting me? And so that's what uh, that's what I, I get asked about in in China, and it's it's just it's just absolutely amazing to me to see how China has, has used the concept and, and taken this five-stage framework to analyze what the gray rhinos are that are facing it. And, um, you know, in some ways, you know, the United States is, is the, the, the policy uncertainty, uh, the sort of lurching back and forth from the United States is, is another very, very big yeah. gray rhino for China. Great. Uh, Peng, can I ask uh, you, um, there's a lot of talk about China's role in the global innovation ecosystem. Uh, how do you look at that? Is China a rule taker, a rule breaker, or a rule maker within the global technology ecosystem? Thank you, Greg. Very wonderful questions. I'll try to answer. Uh, I, I'd like to first to review evolution of a Chinese, uh, China's role in the global uh, innovation uh, ecosystem. I would like to say in three stages. The first one, uh, the first stage is China is as a, a followers. Maybe 30 years ago, well, you know, we all follow the, for example, the Hewlett Packard. They, they set up their, their company in China. Uh, all the telecom, Chinese telecom operators, they just uh, buy, bought the uh, Hewlett Packard's or IBM's uh, the, the systems. They really think they have very advanced technologies. Uh, and then, it's happened, we say, the second stage could be, we say, the participants. Uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, quite, you know, lots of Chinese um, 
talent, as they got education. Uh, I think majority in U.S. <laughs> universities, they, 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 uh, they be, for example, they enter into the U.S. multinationals or the startups. When they're successful, they, they just kind of being engineers. So that's the second stage. Uh, for the for the third stage is China is playing as a key uh, participants, yeah. key players. Innovator. Yes. For example, they they are being the, the founders of uh, uh, of the uh, entrepreneur uh, on startups. Either could be a technology founders or could be uh, the the the, uh, the annual investors as well. Um, so even for, for for the multinationals as, as well, China more and more company being some kind of a multinational company as well. From investor perspective, you will see, well, maybe if you look at the 20 years ago, uh, why entrepreneurs present a BP a business plan to, to the investors, oh, we, we, sometimes they always say, okay, do you have a similar model in the US? So you can see uh, in US, you, uh, here they have, Bi uh, they have Google, in China we have Baidu, so there are similar things happening. But now, you know, yeah, so it has happened, so in China now, it's a, because of the market-driven, or not driven, so we have some innovation uh, happen here. That's a wonderful, one, wonderful response. Yeah, China is, uh, by many indices, uh, the, one of the most innovative countries on earth, and becoming more so every, every day. Uh, Angelica, could I ask you, uh, how are investors thinking about uh, the policy envi environment and planning for the long term? This is not easy with so much uncertainty. I'd be grateful to know how you look at it. Sure. So first of all, when thinking about the future, uh, we, as investors, we must ensure that uh, we invest in companies that have sustainability uh, in their DNA. Um, so uh, to expand on this, I'd like to make three points. Uh, we need to, we need, um, one is the need for businesses and for investors alike to prioritize um, the sustainable development goals or the ESG as, as we call it in the, in the investment world, environmental, social, governmental, which, uh, which reflect entirely the challenges that the world is facing. Um, and to do so in a concerted effort uh, to develop a stakeholder-driven uh, form of capitalism, which I see as the only way forward. Uh, the second point is the role of technology firms uh, in, uh, in accomplishing these goals and, and constructing the right model of globalization. And, and the third one is the imperative need for cooperation amongst all stakeholders uh, to develop a uniform ethical and normative approach um, to, to regulate the risks associated with, with development of deep tech. Um, so to this point, uh, I think work needs to be done on, the, uh, on developing interoperability uh, between countries, setting standards and norms, um, just like mobile phones uh, did in the past when we couldn't use a, a, a phone from Europe to, uh, in, 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 in the States or in China or vice versa. So let's not forget the main reason we're talking about globalization now. It's, it's because the, la the one that started a few decades ago failed uh, to work for everyone. There were many losers and, uh, and winners, of course. Um, technology was, was a big part of it, and technology will remain um, a, ve a core vector of the next phase of globalization, but now we are much better equipped to understand the consequences of it and to understand the need to better redistribute um, the, um, um, the, uh, the, the benefits uh, it brings. But in order to accomplish this, uh, cooperation is required, it's imperative, and technological development must not be seen as a zero-sum game. No, oh, that's great. Ma Max, can I ask you, please? Um, you are really an engine of globalization, uh, but I'm sure that that has, uh, you face many challenges. For a Chinese leader in globalization, can I ask you, what are the major challenges to leave China and operate effectively in the global economy? What are the unique challenges that a Chinese company faces outside of China? Uh, okay, I use uh, Chinese to speak. It's much better than my Chinglish. We went. Uh, 
，在过去的三十年当中，我们在全球包括五十多个国家去做了大量的这个呃工程建设。呃，我过去的其实三十年有至少十五年左右的时间都在海外不同的国家。那么，呃，在过去当中，其实我们在这个全球化的这个过程当中，我们呢做了很多的工作，但是。最近这些年呢，我们开始遇到巨大的压力，所以发展速度呢开始有一些这个这个减缓，尤其是我们跟美国之间的这个关系造成了巨大的压力。此前我们呢帮助美国公司在中国以及第三第三方国家做了很多的这个工程，呃，而且也在美国做了很多的工程，包括我们就在这个呃拉斯维加斯旁边的那个中立泉，我们也做了太阳能电站。我们在美国已经做了十几个电站，包括在英国，我们当然此前也做了十几个太阳能电站。在英国的前四名的这个太阳能电站当中，三个是由我们来建造的。在美国的也有一个非常大一百兆瓦的，哎，就在中立泉。那么现在的这个欧洲的双反，对于太阳能产品的欧洲欧洲的双反和美国的这个双反，就是加税的这个政策，确实呢，让这个竞争力呃越来越弱了。就是中国呢，其实百分之九十以上的产品是出口美国和欧洲的，其实我们只有大概百分之十左右是用于自己的这个电站。但是呢，在这种全球化的过程当中呢，我们遇到了呃前所未有的压力。呃，所以我前面说到，我们应该呃建立在自豪、自信和自省的这三个这个基础上，我们应该理解。其实我们不用太过于担心，呃，尤其是美国，其实不需要过于担心，因为它本身就是在领导世界全球化走过很多年，而且呢，只是呢现在感觉到有压力，所以有这种想法。其实我们也很理解，但是我认为，就是作为我们做工程的人来说，现在已经全球化的过程当中，很多东西都需要合作，比如说 Musk， 他现在做了很多的这个创新的。呃，这个公司包括特斯拉，包括呃 Power Wall， 就是在太阳能方面的，也包括在这个交通方面的，其实不都是他自己在做的，他是利用了全球的最顶级的研发人才，在为某一个项目在做，所以我们公司其实也是在做这样的工作，就是为了有最创新的、最领先的一些技术，不能完全靠自己，我们一定是全球化的进行一些这个合作。所以在过去的这些年，比如说风电，我们现在是最大的风电叶片的制造商。其实我们的这个技术原本是收购了一家德国公司，他疲于倒闭，而我们呢，给了他非常好的支撑，让他有很多的这个研发，并且呢获得很多的利益。同时，我们合作在中国建立了非常大的这个工厂，成为最大的风电叶片的制造商。这就是一个很好的国际化的这种合作例子。所以。呃，我还是觉得，就是下一步，就是中美之间其实具有非常非常广阔的合作空间，是完全可以双赢的，其不用过于的害怕，这是我的观点。谢谢。I I I love your thinking. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and Ben, can I follow up with you? Um, I frankly learned more about AI uh, in the five minutes that you spoke than the rest of my life. Uh, but um, let me ask you a really uh, uh, a difficult question that I'm wrestling with, um, and and that is what what are the rules of the road for technology? What should be the rules of the road? For technology cooperation between China and the United States, what should be the rules of the road for technology competition between the United States and China? And if those are too easy, let me ask you a difficult question: <laughs> How do you enforce those rules? <laughs> I'd be grateful for your thoughts. <laughs> I think. Software is famously slippery, right? And AI, AI software is is probably even slippery in various ways because it's it's adapting and changing from even how you, how you started out, and it, it, it's learning 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 all the time. So just as software patents have not really been as positively successful and impactful as patents in 
you know, aspects of electronics design or biotech or something. Because you can patent one thing in software, but then you can always vary on it and do something slightly different, right? I mean, similarly, re regulating AI is going to be really, really hard. Like, I mean, you don't, we don't know what's the borderline between AI and, and statistics or, 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 or software. And I mean, what we're talking about is a global brain emerging from connecting some components that have some measure of what I call AGI or artificial general intelligence, some narrow AIs, some devices that may not be intelligent in themselves, but they're adaptive sensors or something, right? And you have this whole complex ecosystem of components with different levels of generality of intelligence and adaptiveness. They're connecting together. Some of the intelligence is in the whole emergent network rather than in the individual components. I mean, we're, we, we, we're not gonna regulate that the way we're trying and failing to regulate encryption algorithms or something, right? It's not, it's not like, you know, plutonium or something, where there's some material you can lock up and, and control its export. You're talking about an ever-shifting and adapting, you know, set of forms of, 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 of inform information. And it, it's going to be a challenge to regulate and, and control. I, I, I think you need to think about it more in terms of, you know, ongoing guidance and, and stewardship of this complex evolving system of, of AI tools. We should think about, it's a bit scary, but I mean, we should think about it more like raising a child than, than, than like regulating the back and forth of, of some nuclear material or something, right? I mean, we're, the, the various people on earth, including technologists and users of, of products and, and creators of other companies that leverage AI, I mean, all the people in the world today and the software they've created, we're creating a non-human mind, right? And it's a non-human mind with many, many different pieces, which is the software and hardware products that we're all building that are all talking to each other. And scarily enough, the parents of this non-human mind, you know, include U.S. government, Chinese government, Russian government, like companies all around the world and people all around the world. And the intelligence is growing globally, right? And sometimes a new capability pops up in U.S. first, sometimes in China first, sometimes in Russia first, but it, then it, 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 it always spreads, right? So then how, how are we cooperating to bring this new form of intelligence, which may end up smarter than all of us eventually, I think it will within our lifetimes even, how are we cooperating to bring this new form of intelligence into being in the optimal way, optimal both in terms of its intelligence and in, in terms of its, you know, its ethical orientation and, 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 it, and its compassion. I mean, the, the truth is right now, you know, the powers that be in the world are not really focusing on, you know, how, how do we shape the, the psyche of this global brain AI that we're creating in an optimal way. Instead, we're, we're focusing on, on quite different things, but this global intelligence is, is emerging anyway. And how, how to get leaders of corporations and governments to really think in terms of collective stewardship of the emergence of a global AI mind, is a, that, that may be above my pay grade. Right? <laughs> that may be harder than building the AI itself, but I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful some progress can, can be made. Can you regulate AI through uh, copyright, trademark, trade secret? No, because I mean you could re you could regulate a specific file of software code by a copyright, but you could have another software code that does exactly the same thing with all different characters, and it's not covered by covered by copyright. We we don't have a adequate way even to patent software that isn't intelligent, let alone to how do you patent the mind state of an AI which it learned from what it, what it observed in, in, in the world. I mean, we, we, we don't have meaningful intellectual property regulation there. And I'm guessing AI will keep changing year on year much faster than our, our regulatory systems are going to, be able to, going to be able to keep up with it. Well, I... I at least could go on for another hour, but I'm told uh, that uh, our session uh, is to uh, end. Let me just uh, remark uh, that AI uh, seems to be a little bit like globalization itself. It is unformable, it, there, there's no form, it is unstoppable, it is global, it cannot be regulated, it, 
uh, uh, competition and cooperation are taking new and un unpredictable forms uh, and uh, it is accelerating rapidly. What a world we live in. <laughs> I don't know uh, what to do now except give our uh, panelists a, a big round of applause. <laughs> and our